Chapter 77 Dividing an Inheritance The year was 1957. Bankswood had a good reason for buying a house next door to William Branham. In January of 1950, his wife Ruby persuaded him to attend a Branham meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. Banks had been raised in the Jehovah Witness movement, so the idea that Jesus could heal sick people today seemed ridiculous to him. That night in Louisville, Bankswood watched in amazement as William Branham discerned the problems of strangers. He thought, This seems right, but how can I be sure those people are really getting healed? Then he saw William Branham pray for a boy who was crippled from polio. The boy rose from his wheelchair, ran up the stairs to the platform, and shouted his thanks to Jesus for healing him. That touched Banks deeply because his own little boy David was crippled from polio. Banks felt like he had stumbled across something real. Banks would decided that he had to know more about this unusual ministry, so he and his wife visited the next Branham campaign, which happened to be in Houston, Texas at the end of January 1950. They were sitting in the audience on the night when the pillar of fire was photographed above William Branham's head. Banks drove home to Kentucky with a lot on his mind. In August of 1950, William Branham held a two-week-long campaign in Cleveland, Ohio. One night, Banks, Ruby, and little David Wood joined thousands of others who flocked into a large tent. During the prayer service, William Branham turned away from the prayer line, looked out of the audience, and said, Way in the back sits a man with his family. Your name is Wood, Banks Wood. You're not from this city. You live near Crestwood, Kentucky. You are a Jehovah's Witness by faith. You've got a little boy sitting there with a paralyzed leg drawn up underneath him, and your wife suffers with a tumor. Thus saith the Lord, they are both healed. The evangelist turned back to the prayer line. For a shocked moment, Banks and Ruby stared at each other, not knowing what to do. Then Ruby felt something cool pass through her body. She touched her side where the tumor had been. Banks, she gasped. Feel this. The knot is gone. He felt his wife's side for the ominous lump. It wasn't there. He said to his son, David, get up. Even while David squirmed to obey, his crippled legs straightened. He stood on two solid working limbs. Not surprisingly, David Wood did not want to sit back down. Nor was it surprising that Banks Wood surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Selling his house and his construction business in Kentucky, he moved to Jeffersonville, Indiana, so he could attend church weekly at Branham Tabernacle. After he bought the house next door to Bill, the two neighbors became good friends. When Banks Wood accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, his father, mother, brothers, and sisters, all of whom were staunch Jehovah's Witnesses, disowned him. Banks did not see any of them for many years. Then one morning in April of 1957, his brother Lyle showed up at his door. The two brothers sat at the kitchen table and talked. Eventually, Lyle said, Banks, I came here to see if I could talk some sense back into your thick head. What kind of fanaticism have you got tangled up with? This isn't fanaticism, Lyle. Look at David's legs. Ah, nonsense. Our daddy raised us to know better than that. He always warned us against these hellfire preachers. I can't believe you really fell into such a mess. What kind of a quack are you listening to anyway? He must be a smooth talker to get you to quit building houses and follow him around the country like you do. No, he's not a smooth talker. Actually, he talks kind of plain, but the Spirit of God is with him. Well, if I ever meet this Branham fellow, I'll give him a piece of my mind. There he is out mowing his lawn. I'll call him over. Stepping outside, Banks waved for his neighbor to come over. When Bill entered the kitchen, Banks introduced his brother. Bill offered Lyle a vigorous handshake, but the hand he shook was cold and limp. They sat down to talk behind cups of coffee. Lyle eyed Bill suspiciously. At the moment, he didn't look much like a preacher. He was wearing overalls and a floppy straw hat tipped far back on his head. His face bristled with beard stubble that might have been a day or two growing. Sweat glistened from his balding forehead and soaked his white t-shirt under his armpits. Right now he looked more like a hard-working farmer than a world-renowned evangelist. Lyle said, 
So you're the preacher that has taken Banks on this wild goose chase. No, sir, I'm not. I'm just his brother in Christ. But I do preach the gospel. Banks told Lyle about some of the miracles he had seen in Bill's campaigns. Lyle listened stiffly, showing no interest. After listening to Banks' testimony for ten minutes, Bill said, I suppose you don't believe any of this, Mr. Wood. I certainly don't. There's no such thing as divine healing. It's just a bunch of made-up nonsense that you've got my brother mixed up into. As for these so-called visions... While Lyle was giving his opinion, a vision flashed before Bill's eyes. He said, Mr. Wood, I see you are married to a blonde woman, and you have two blonde-headed boys about six and eight years old. Lyle gave his brother an accusing look. You think Banks told me that, Bill continued. He didn't. He hasn't told me anything about his family. But if that didn't convince you, maybe this will. You've been cheating on your wife, and it's caused a separation. The night before last, you were with a young woman with auburn hair. You heard a knock at the door, and you were going to answer it, but she wouldn't let you. So you hid in her bedroom while she answered it. When you peeked out the window, you saw a man standing at the door wearing a dark suit and red tie. That was another one of her lovers, and it's a good thing you didn't go to the door, because he had a gun in his hand and would have blown your head off. Who, who told you that, Lyle stuttered. Almighty God just showed me a vision of it happening. Lyle felt lightheaded. Mr. Branham, every word you said is a truth. I think I'd better surrender my life to the same Almighty God who told you that secret. Full of enthusiasm, Lyle went home to tell his family about the conversion. Within a week, his sister attended one of Bill's meetings, and she too was converted. That alarmed their father, who decided he had better meet this Branham character for himself so he could straighten out his family. On Monday afternoon, May 13, 1957, Bill turned his car into his driveway and saw an elderly gentleman standing in the yard. Bill walked over and introduced himself. So you're Mr. Branham, the man said gruffly. I've heard a lot about you. My name is Wood, Jim Wood. Banks and Lyle are two of my sons. Do you know where Banks is? Banks and Ruby usually go grocery shopping about this time of day. Won't you come inside and refresh yourself with a glass of water? It didn't take Bill long to learn that he and Mr. Wood had some common interests. First, they talked about growing up in Kentucky. Then they talked about how much fun it was to hunt squirrels and fish for bluegills and crappies, rather than plunging into the subject of Jehovah God. Bill asked Jim Wood to go fishing with him tomorrow thinking that such a trip would give them plenty of time to discuss religion. He suggested that Banks and Lyle would come too. Jim Wood liked the idea. That night it rained hard. The next morning Banks said, Well, I guess there's no need of going fishing today. The streams will all be muddy and the fish won't bite. We can still try, said Bill. He had a few days until his next campaign began in Saskatoon, Canada, and he needed to relax and unwind. So the four men packed their camping and fishing gear into the trunk of Banks' car. Banks and his father sat in the front seat. Bill and Lyle sat in the back. Banks drove. Their destination lay over 150 miles east, near Dale Hollow Lake. Bill planned to fish on the lake behind Wolf River Dam. This area was not far from Burksville, Kentucky, where he was born. Because some of his relatives owned land on the lake and had a boat he could borrow, Bill fished this spot often. While they were crossing the Ohio River into Kentucky, Bill prayed silently, Lord, somehow help me get through to this honest old farmer's heart. Soon he felt himself slipping into a vision. The car vanished and he was somehow further ahead in time, watching the future reveal its secrets. When the vision ended, he said, Mr. Wood, so that you may know this gospel that I preach is real, today every stream and lake we pass will be muddy until we get to our destination. The lake behind Wolf River Dam will be blue and pretty. We shall fish until about 3.30 without catching anything. Then I'm going to start hooking catfish. I've never caught any catfish in these waters before, but today I'm going to catch a string of them, totaling about 25 pounds. Mr. Wood, you're going to fish right beside me using the same bait, 
but you're only going to catch one, and Lyle will catch another. The next morning I'll catch a scaly fish. I couldn't see exactly what kind, but it will be large for its species. That will be the last fish we'll catch on this trip. We will fish the rest of the day without even getting a bite. That is, thus saith the Lord. One side of Jim Wood's mouth curled up slightly in a smirk of disbelief. He looked over at Banks and winked. But the old man started to wonder when they topped the last hill and looked down on Wolf River Dam. The water in the reservoir behind the dam was just as blue and pretty as it could be. Obviously, it had not rained much on the region above the dam. They fished for crappies, bluegill, trout, and bass without success. In the middle of the afternoon, Bill changed his bait and immediately hooked a catfish. Over the next several hours, he caught a string of catfish, while Jim and Lyle each caught one, and Banks didn't catch any. They quit fishing around eleven that night. No one mentioned the prophecy from that morning, although it simmered in everyone's thoughts. Tuesday morning, the sun came up smiling. After a breakfast of fried catfish, the fishermen took their fishing poles and tackle boxes and headed for the lake. As they were baiting their hooks, Bill reminded them, "There is another fish coming, and that will be the last one we'll catch on this trip." On his first cast, Bill hooked a scaly fish with a red belly. It weighed about a pound, which was large for that species of brim. They continued to fish, but no one caught anything else. Every few hours, Banks, who knew how precise Bill's visions were, suggested that they quit and go home. Jim Wood wanted to stay. He was determined to catch another fish and prove them all wrong. The old gentleman moved from spot to spot along the bank, frequently changing his bait and his technique, trying to find some combination that would work. He fished all afternoon, through the evening, even after dark, all the way up to midnight. He didn't even get a nibble. Early Wednesday morning, they dismantled their camp. Bill had to go home because Thursday he was leaving for Saskatoon, Canada. While they were packing the car, Banks asked his father, "What do you think about it now, Dad?" "Well," he drawled, fidgeting with his tackle box, "if a fellow can see a fish before he catches them, I guess that's all right." Bill saw his opening, "But I can't always do that, Mr. Wood. God showed me that vision for your sake. The Bible says, 'If you wonder whether or not a man is a prophet, watch his prophecies.'" If his prophecies don't happen, then he's not a prophet, and you can ignore him. But if they do happen, then you should listen to him, because he has the word of the Lord. I know Mr. Russell is considered a prophet in the Jehovah's Witness movement, but Mr. Russell prophesied that Jesus Christ would return in 1914. When that didn't happen, he said it was a spiritual coming. But that's not right. Because Jesus came back to Earth spiritually on the day of Pentecost in the form of the Holy Ghost, that is what the Book of Acts is all about. So you see, Mr. Russell can't be a prophet. Bill continued along this line, showing three other places where Russell's prophecies failed. Jim Wood rubbed his jaw thoughtfully, then he pointed his thumb back over his shoulder at the lake and quoted the Ethiopian in Acts 8:36. Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? There was nothing to hinder, so right then and there he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In May of 1957, William Branham traveled north to Saskatoon, Canada. This was his first major healing campaign without any Pentecostal churches sponsoring him. Instead, his support came from Presbyterians, Anglicans, Baptists, and other denominations. The Pentecostal churches in Saskatoon flatly refused to cooperate, but that did not hinder God. Several thousand people filled the ice arena to hear Bill speak. When it came time for the prayer line, God's Spirit moved as smoothly and beautifully as a figure skater on ice. On the first night of the campaign, a blind woman miraculously received her sight. A spastic boy instantly regained his coordination. Another boy who had never heard or uttered a sound in his life suddenly heard the organist playing "Only Believe." The boy screamed, which was the only way he could praise his healer, Jesus Christ. One night, a hunchback boy came through the prayer line. Bill put his arms around the lad and prayed for him. Then he said, "When you go home tonight, have your mommy pull a string around your chest over the hump." 
Have her cut the string off for a measurement. Tomorrow morning, if that hump hasn't shrunk by three inches, then I'm a false prophet. Bring the string back here tomorrow night and show the people. The next night, this boy came up front and showed everyone the string his mother had used to measure his chest. His hump had indeed shrunk three inches. Even more amazing was the fact that now he could raise his arms above his head, a feat that is normally impossible for hunchbacks because of the deformities in their arm sockets. While people were lining up for prayer, Bill said, "I'm going to tie two scriptures together now." When Jesus told Nathaniel where he was before he came to the meeting, what did Nathaniel say? He said, "Rabbi, thou art the Son of God; thou art the King of Israel." That is what a Jew thought when he saw the sign of discernment done. When that Samaritan woman heard the discernment, she said, "Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet." We Samaritans know that when the Messiah cometh, he will do these things. Jesus said, "I am He who speaks to you." Upon that sign, she left her water pot and went to tell the villagers, "Come and see a man who told me the things I have done. Isn't this the very Messiah?" If that was the sign of the Messiah in their day, then it's the sign of the Messiah today. Take all your denominational isms out of it now. And just look at the truth of it in the word: Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. After this introduction, an usher brought forward the first person in the prayer line. When the vision came, Bill said, "I know this woman is a Christian because her spirit is saying 'Welcome, lady. You are a preacher's wife, and you're suffering from a tumor in your breast. You're not from this city. I see the West Coast and a big city where there's a big park." Vancouver, British Columbia. That's where it is. Is that the truth? She said it was true. Bill laid a hand on her shoulder and prayed, "Almighty God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bless this woman and ask for her healing in Christ's name. Amen." Next in line stood a man who said, "I am a pastor, and that woman you just prayed for is my wife. Everything you told her is true, and I can vouch that we are both strangers to you." Thank you, my brother. You have something wrong with your shoulder. You had a motorcycle accident, and your shoulder never went back to its place just right. It's over now. You can go on your road rejoicing and be well. God bless you. Amen. To the next woman in line, he said, "Believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I am His prophet or His servant." Now, if the audience can still hear my voice. I see this woman is nervous about something. I see her going into a little room. It's a bathroom, and there she fell and bruised her chest about a year ago. She hasn't gone to a doctor about it. She's trusted God. That is the truth. Isn't that right, lady? All right. Go to your seat and be well then in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All over the building, bits of doubt were falling off Christians like ice falls from frosty trees when the sunshine warms their branches. Bill said to the next woman in line, "Lady, I don't know you. We're strangers to each other." Suddenly, he turned his head and stared into the audience, watching the light of the angel. Something happened in the audience. Somebody somewhere believed. Intensely, he studied the crowd. Then he pointed. It's that little black-headed lady sitting over there, looking over another lady's shoulder. She suffers with headaches. She was praying, "Lord, have him call me." You've been having tremendous headaches. If that's right, raise your hand. Her hand went up. All right, it's over. You can go on your road and rejoice and be made well in Christ's name. The angel was not yet through with that spot. The vision spilled over. The lady sitting behind you has arthritis, and she's been wanting to be healed. That's right, isn't it, lady? That's right. Bill staggered from the strain of the visions that were draining him. See, you couldn't hide your life if you had to. None of you could. Amen. Oh, I'm happy that he's raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He turned back to the woman waiting on the platform beside him. Lady, you're not here for yourself. You're here because you have a mentally retarded son. She gasped. Then he prayed for her son. The next patient was an elderly woman who had a large growth on her nose. The vision revealed her history. 
Bill said, There is more than one growth. They fall off and they come back again somewhere else. You've got one now on your chest. You're not from this city. You come from the West. You're from Edmonton, Alberta. Your name is Pearl L-E-N-N-O-X. Miss Pearl Lennox. If you'll believe with all your heart, you'll get well. So it went, person after person, vision after vision, night after night, always perfect. On this last night in Saskatoon, that woman who had been blind on the first night of this campaign now walked up to the podium and handed Bill a letter containing her testimony, a letter she had typed herself. After this faith healing campaign in Saskatoon, William Branham held his next long campaign in Indianapolis, Indiana, June 11th to the 14th, 1957. He returned from Indianapolis aching with weariness. Besides the 15 to 20 visions he saw nightly in the prayer services, he also saw 20 to 30 visions a day during private interviews, which he granted in his hotel room. The strain of all these visions had siphoned off most of his energy. He had 14 days to rest before his next campaign in Chicago on June 29th, so he asked Banks and Lyle Wood if they wanted to go fishing with him. They did. The evening before their fishing trip, Bill and Banks walked out to Banks' garden to dig up some worms to use for bait. While they were digging, 11-year-old Rebecca ran over to the garden, but not to see the worms. Her lower lip quivered like she was about to cry. Daddy, I found a poor old kitty that has eaten some poison, and now she's all swollen and going to die. Would you let me keep her until she dies? Bill didn't like cats very much, and seldom allowed them around the house. But when Rebecca looked at him with those sad, pleading eyes, he softened. Well, if it's going to die soon, I guess we could keep it for a while. Let me see it. Rebecca ran away and soon returned with a sick cat in a cardboard box. Remembering what happened when her father had prayed for that dying possum, Rebecca said, Daddy, will you pray for this kitty? Bill took one look at the cat and knew what was going to happen. He told Rebecca to put the animal in the shed for the night. Early the next morning, Rebecca ran out to the shed to check on her kitty. Looking in the box, she squealed with delight. The cat was nursing a dozen kittens. While Bill was loading Banks' car with camping equipment, two-year-old Joseph toddled over to the shed holding one of the newborn kittens by its neck. Joseph, don't hold that kitty like that, Bill scolded. Startled, Joseph squeezed the kitten hard before dropping it. Bill took the kitten back to the shed and laid it beside its mother. The kitten squirmed like it might be badly hurt. Bill thought, Poor little thing, it can't help being a cat. I hope it's all right. Banks, Lyle, and Bill headed for Dale Hollow, the same place in Kentucky where they had fished with Jim Wood last month. When they reached Wolf River Dam, Bill borrowed a boat from his relatives. Once out in the lake, the three men baited their hooks with worms and soon caught several dozen little sunfish which they cut into pieces and used to bait their trout lines. Then they settled back to wait for the big ones. A light bluish haze covered the green Appalachian Mountains around them. The lake smelled of algae, fish, and two-cycle engine oil. Sunshine warmed Bill's shirt and a gentle breeze cooled his face. Watching a pair of ducks bobbing along the reeds and water lilies, he felt his weariness float away like dandelion puffs drifting with the breeze. While their little boat trolled lazily along the shoreline, the three men talked about the Bible. They discussed the time Peter, James, and John saw Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. Jesus began to shine like the sun. When Peter wrote about this experience, he said, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. You know, Banks said, that's sort of the way I feel, because I've been privileged to spend so much time with a holy man like you, Brother Bill. Oh, Brother Banks, don't say that, Bill answered. I'm not a holy man. There's no such thing as a holy man. It's just a holy God dwelling in a man. There isn't a holy mountain either, just a holy God who visits the mountain. I think that is what Peter is saying. 
They discussed how a holy God could dwell in his people. Banks mentioned an elderly woman he knew who had the Spirit of God dwelling in her. When Banks and Lyle were boys, this lady often invited them into her home, where she fed them freshly baked bread and told them about the love of Jesus. They took the bread, but left Jesus behind. Banks said, that lady must be over 90 years old by now. You know, Lyle, she lives close to here. Wouldn't it be nice if we stopped by her house and told her that we're both Christians now? When Banks said this, Bill felt the Spirit of God splash over him like a cool spray from a water spout. In a flash of inspiration, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Soon you will see the glory of God, for there is a little animal that will be raised from the dead. When he came back to his senses, he saw Banks and Lyle staring at him in amazement. Banks said, Brother Bill, did you really mean that the way it sounded? What did I say? Bill asked, honestly not knowing. After Banks repeated the prophecy, Bill assured him, It will happen just the way it was spoken. It has to. Because it wasn't me that said it. It was the Holy Ghost. What do you think that animal will be? asked Lyle. I don't know, but I could guess. This morning my little boy squeezed a kitten too hard. It wasn't dead when we left, but maybe it will die. And then, when we get home, God will give it back its life. They fished throughout the day without success. The big fish didn't bite until late that evening, but when they did, in a matter of minutes, each man reeled in a trout, and the three trout together weighed twenty pounds. By then they had run out of bait, so they quit for the day. In the morning, after a breakfast of pan-fried trout, they climbed into their little boat, started the outboard engine, and trolled along the reservoir parallel to the shore. They fished for bluegills and sunfish to replenish their supply of bait, but at first they didn't catch anything. Then Bill pointed the bow of their boat into a little cove. When he throttled the motor down, the engine sputtered and died. Then he let the boat drift in close to shore. Sticking a worm on his hook, he cast his line, and soon a fish nibbled on the bait. One jerk hooked a little bluegill. While they were fishing in this cove, they talked about the power of God. They discussed the time Jesus said to Simon the fisherman, Launch out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word I will let down the net. As soon as Peter dropped his net into the lake, the net filled with so many fish that it started to break. He called for his partners in another boat to come and help him. They filled both boats with so many fish that the boats began to sink. Bill said he didn't think those fish were in the lake before Jesus spoke. He believed God actually created those fish on the spot. Winged bugs skittered over the water. The bluegills and sunfish were hungry. Regularly they swam to the surface and snapped their jaws on a bug. Because bluegills are so small, Bill was using a fly rod with a tiny number four hook. Lyle, on the other hand, was using a large number 12 hook, the same hook he used to catch trout. Lyle impaled a worm on the hook's point and then cast his line. Really, he was paying more attention to the conversation between Banks and Bill than he was to his fishing. Feeling a tug on his line, Lyle reeled it in and was surprised to find that a bluegill had swallowed his hook all the way down into its stomach. Look at this, he said, holding up his line with the three-inch long fish dangling on the end. You can't even see the hook. Gripping the bluegill in one hand and wrapping his line around his other hand, Lyle pulled. With a tearing sound, the hook came out, bringing with it the animal's stomach and part of its gills. Lyle whistled in surprise and said, Little fishy, you've shot your last wad. After working his hook free, he tossed the fish overboard. For a few moments, the bluegill thrashed his fins and tail, struggling to swim away. Then it flopped over on its side and died. It floated limp and lifeless, ten feet from the boat, drifting slowly toward the shore, nudged by a gentle breeze and the lapping of waves. Lyle, that didn't need to happen, Bill said. You should use a smaller hook. Then as soon as you feel the fish bite, jerk your line. That will set the hook in its jaw. Ah, I'm just a country boy who hasn't done much fishing, Lyle said, 
poking another worm with his number 12 hook. This is the way I've always done it. Banks and Bill resumed their discussion on the power of God. About 30 minutes later, Bill mentioned a scripture that had always puzzled him. One morning when Jesus was hungry, he looked for figs on a fig tree. Finding none, he cursed the tree. By that evening, all the leaves on the tree had turned brown. When the disciples marveled at how soon the tree had withered, Jesus said, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, Whosoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. While he talked, Bill watched that little dead fish bobbing not far from the boat. The breeze had pushed it up against some water lilies. There it floated on its side, its entrails bulging from its green mouth, its characteristic blue gills now turned white. Suddenly Bill heard a strange noise. Looking up, he saw the angel of the Lord burning like a fire on the mountainside. Down the mountain it came in a whirlwind, rushing over the treetops, heading straight for the boat. Then the angel was beside him, the roar of the whirlwind filling his senses. The angel ordered, Stand. Bill stood. Lyle asked Banks, What's he doing? Quiet, said Banks. Something is going to happen. The angel said, Speak to that fish, and it will live again. Pointing at the dead bluegill floating by the lilies, Bill said, Little fish, Jesus Christ gives you back your life. Immediately the angel vanished. With all three men watching, that bluegill sucked in its stomach, flipped its body upright, and swam down through the water to rejoin its school. Lyle fell over backwards in the boat. He stuttered, Oh, Brother Bill, uh, do you think that, uh, that was for me because I said that, Fish, you shot your last wad? No, Brother Lyle, God was simply showing his great power, confirming the scriptures we have just been talking about. But why? asked Banks. You said yourself you have hundreds of people on your prayer list, including a bunch of spastic children. Why would God use his power to resurrect a little fish? He's God, and he can do whatever he wants. That is scriptural. Think of all the lepers who were in Jerusalem the day Jesus used his power to curse a fig tree. See, it just goes to show that God is concerned about everything. If he is interested enough in a little fish to speak back its life, he certainly will speak eternal life into all of his children. He's God, and he can do whatever he wants. That is scriptural. Think of all the lepers who were in Jerusalem the day Jesus used his power to curse a fig tree. See, it just goes to show that God is concerned about everything. If he is interested enough in a little fish to speak back its life, he certainly will speak eternal life into all his children. In August, William Branham flew north again, this time to Alberta, Canada, for a nine-day faith healing campaign in the city of Edmonton. The crowds were large, but the reception they gave him was cool. By the third night, Bill knew something was wrong. The faith of these Canadians should be rising like the heat from a prairie fire. Instead, their attitude seemed as cold as permafrost. When Bill finished preaching, he said, Between here and where that step goes down, you see that light circling? It just now appeared. I believe that light is the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. Later that pillar of fire became flesh and lived among us in the form of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. When he was on earth, Jesus said, I come from God and I go back to God. I believe that when he returned to God, he went back into the form of that light. It is the same light that struck Paul blind in the road to Damascus. Paul asked, Who art thou, Lord? And the light replied, I am Jesus. I believe it is the same light that came to the Apostle Peter that night in prison, opened the prison doors, and led him out. I truly believe that Almighty God is the Creator of the heavens and the earth, and Jesus Christ is His Son, who is present with us now. He is answering the prayer of that little woman sitting right there. Bill pointed to a dark-headed woman sitting close to the front. You're suffering with nervous trouble. The man sitting next to you is suffering with back trouble. You are husband and wife. Raise your hands if those things are true. They both raise their hands. Do you have prayer cards? You don't. 
You don't need any. You are both healed. Jesus Christ makes you well. Amen. The man sitting right behind them has got gallbladder trouble. Your name is Clarence. You're from a place called Grand Prairie. That's right, isn't it? Your gallbladder trouble has ended, sir. You can go home and be well. Amen. You say, Brother Branham, you called that man's name. Didn't Jesus Christ, when he was here in the body of flesh, tell Simon his name was Simon, and his father's name was Jonas, and he'd be called Peter after that? Jesus is still the same today. There hangs that light over a woman. She's suffering with high blood pressure. Her name is Mrs. Fishbrook. Stand to your feet. You're from this city. You live on 125th Street. Your house number is 13104. If that's right, raise your hand. All right, Mrs. Fishbrook, you're healed. Jesus Christ makes you well. Do you believe his presence is here? I want every man and woman who is backslidden or who has just accepted Jesus Christ to come forward so I can ask a blessing over you while the anointing is here. The organist played a hymn. Although there were thousands of people in the auditorium, no one came forward. Eventually, Bill said, What's the matter with you Canadians? You get so churchy until you leave Christ out. It's good to be conservative, but don't be so starchy that you grieve the Spirit away. You won't have any revival. At that moment, he saw a black wave roll over the audience. He warned, If I am the prophet of God, I speak in his name. You had better get right with God because the hour is coming when you're going to scream to find this, and you won't find it. That is, thus saith the Lord. If the love of God is not in your heart, you're a sinner, and you're on the road to hell. That is, thus saith the Lord. The same God who discerns the spirits and tells people their condition is speaking right now. I speak in the name of Jesus Christ. Fly to the altar and repent quickly before God turns the page over on you and you're doomed forever. Thus saith the Holy Spirit that is in the midst of us now. After more pleading and persuading, a few repentant souls straggled up to the front for prayer. Bill felt gravely disappointed because he knew that there were many more people in his audience who needed salvation and that even the Christians there needed revival. Friends, I have not seen this happen in years. I have never before had such a feeling as came over me just a few moments ago when I saw that black wave roll through the building. Something struck me. God knows that is the truth. Something is wrong. When he woke the next morning, he still felt discouraged. What was wrong? Why didn't these Christians in Edmonton recognize the presence of Jesus Christ in their midst? and receive all the blessings that came with that revelation. Bill wondered if it was his fault. Maybe he wasn't presenting the gospel the best way it could be presented. Sitting up in bed, he took his Schofield Reference Bible off the nightstand and browsed through his notes he had written on the back flyleaf. He read again about the vision he saw in 1952 on the morning when God had healed him from those deadly amoebas. He remembered how a disembodied hand pointed to Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, suggesting that these verses applied to Bill's ministry as much as it did to Joshua's. He closed his Bible, but he didn't lay it down. Instead, he held it upright between his two palms while he sat brooding. Soon he felt the angel of the Lord come into his hotel room. Bill's melancholy changed to fear. He jerked his hands up near his heart and folded them for prayer, expecting God to speak to him at any moment. As soon as he removed his hands from his Bible, the book parted in two. His Bible was well worn for many years of constant use. It could have fallen open to any one of hundreds of places that he often read. Now it fell open to Joshua chapter 1. Bill read, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong, and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong, and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. His fear subsided. 
His depression lifted and his confidence returned. God had called him by an angel and was leading him by his spirit through visions. Even if every Christian denomination rejected him, it would not change the fact that God had ordained him to do what he was doing. He used to think his only task was to take a gift of divine healing to the world. Then God showed him the three parts of his ministry, the three pulls on that fishing line. The first two pulls represented his healing ministry, but the third pull was different. The third pull would catch the big fish, the trophy fish. The third pull would call those people who are the bride of Jesus Christ and would divide them for an inheritance in the land which God swore he would give them. Somewhere there had to be people who would hear it, recognize the truth, and act upon it. Jesus said, The truth shall make you free. Bill turned to the front of his Schofield Study Bible and found the page that said, How to Use the Study References. Picking up his pen, he wrote in the margins, It has been for some time that this first chapter of Joshua opens to me. This morning of August 7, 1957, I have been sick and nervous and I looked at a vision that was given me, which is wrote on the fly leaf in the back of the book. Then I opened the book. Again it turned to the same chapter. Dear Jesus Christ, help me to be courageous for your glory. Brother Branham Flipping the pages back to Joshua chapter 1, Bill scrawled at the top of the page, I promise by God's help to be courageous from this day on. August 7, 1957 In October of 1957, Bill organized his usual fall hunting trip to the Coral Peaks Wilderness Area in northern Colorado. They reached their campsite late in the afternoon. While they were setting up their tents, some of the men said they didn't feel well. In the morning it was clear that everyone except Bill had come down with the Asian flu. Aching from fevers, these sick men didn't even feel like eating, let alone hunting. They were so miserable that they didn't take their rifles out of their gun cases. They simply packed up their tents and drove home, with Bill following. As soon as Bill got home from Colorado, he made arrangements for a fishing expedition into central Idaho. A few days later, he and some companions drove to Ketchum, Idaho, and then north into the Sawtooth Mountain wilderness area. When he looked at the Sawtooth Mountains behind Redfish Lake, Bill knew how they got their name. These tall jagged peaks did indeed look like the teeth of a giant saw pointing up. The fishermen rented horses for themselves and pack horses for their supplies, and then they rode way back into the wilderness, setting up their camp in a meadow next to the east fork of the Salmon River. The Indians and early settlers called this river the River of No Return because it meandered several hundred miles to the west where it joined the Snake River and later the Columbia River before finally emptying into the Pacific Ocean. Since Bill was fishing in the fall of the year near its headwaters, the water level of the Salmon River was quite low in some stretches, but collected in deeper pools wherever the course of the river curved or leveled out. This made for excellent fishing, because the largest trout were forced into these pools. The nights were chilly, but the days were still warm. Snow had not yet fallen. Autumn colors brightened the mountain slopes and the valley floor. Evergreen trees were interspersed with the reddish needles of tamarack trees and the bright orange leaves of shrubs like huckleberry bushes. In the wetter ground next to the Salmon River, aspen and poplar trees flourished, now displaying their orange and yellow leaves. There was a certain smell in the air that brought back memories of his childhood, of hunting in the fall when he was a boy. He grew wistful. Bill felt his pent-up tension slowly leaving. This was the type of country he loved best. Here in this wilderness he could relax, surrounded by breathtaking mountain scenery, Here the demands of civilization could not reach him, or so he thought. The day after setting up their camp, Bill went fly fishing by one of these pools where the river made a bend. Standing on a granite boulder, he cast his fly line as far out into the pool as he could make it go. The light feathery hook landed on the top of the water but didn't sink. 
That was by design. Bill pulled it back to shore in short jerks that imitated the movements of a bug skittering over the surface of the river. The pool was crystal clear. Soon he saw a torpedo-like shape swimming out from underneath a log that was half in and half out of the river. The trout lunged for what he thought was a bug, and then it was hooked. Now the battle began. The fisherman trying to reel in his prize, and the trout fighting desperately to get away. It was a monster of a trout. A less experienced fisherman might easily have pulled too hard, too soon, and thus broken his line. But Bill knew exactly what to do. In a few minutes, he had that trout safely in his pickup net. He continued fly fishing, but it wasn't long until he heard the drone of an airplane approaching. Looking up, he spotted a piper cub flying up the valley towards his camp. This small plane was following the river and flying fairly low. As if the pilot was searching for something or someone, as it passed overhead, Bill waved. The pilot must have seen him wave because the plane circled again and flew back towards him. When it passed overhead again, a small object attached to a parachute dropped from the plane. While the parachute drifted down into a nearby meadow, the plane flew back down the valley and was soon out of sight. Walking over to investigate the parachute, Bill discovered it was connected to a canister with a screw on top. Bill unscrewed the lid. There was a folded piece of paper inside. He unfolded it and was surprised to find it was a message for him. His brother Howard had just died, and the family wanted Bill to speak at Howard's funeral. The next morning, Bill and his companions loaded their camping gear onto their pack horses and rode back towards the demands of civilization. After Howard's funeral, William Branham left Jeffersonville for a short campaign in Lakeport, a city in Northern California. The Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship had arranged for these meetings to be held in a large building at the fairgrounds. Several thousand people sat on folding metal chairs. One night, Bill preached on a scripture that was haunting him lately, and Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark eleven twenty three called to him. He couldn't get away from it. Something lay hidden there, something powerful that he didn't quite understand. However, on this night in Lakeport, he emphasized verse twenty four, where Jesus encouraged his followers to have faith when they prayed. Near the end of his sermon, a photographer on his right side snapped a couple of pictures. When he developed his color film, the first picture looked normal, showing the right side of William Branham standing beside a pulpit making a gesture while preaching. A wicker basket full of lilies decorated the right side of the podium, next to a single microphone fixed to the top of a floor-length stand. Behind him, hanging from the ceiling, was the square metal box of an electric heater. Two men sat on folding metal chairs at the back of the stage. Beside these men hung a curtain. Swooping down from a single point above and fanning out below, either for decoration or to hide something that could not easily be moved. In the next photograph, the stage looked like a surreal painting, blazing with licks of fire and blotchy with patches of amber-colored mist. The angel of the Lord stood on Bill's right side, looking like a cloud about six feet tall. He stood between the evangelist and the people who had formed into a prayer line on the left side of the building. Bill always had the people in the prayer line approach him from his right side, so they would have to stop and stand in the presence of that angel. In this picture, the angel was not the only astonishing form that was visible. Directly behind Bill was the profile of Jesus, face, beard, neck, with his arms extended and tongues of fire flying from his hands, seven distinct strands of fire, marching like messengers rushing toward the man who is preaching. Bill's body seemed to be absorbed into the glow of that supernatural fire. 
When Bill looked at this photograph later, he said it reminded him of scenes the prophets had described in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4 verse 5. In such an atmosphere, miracles were bound to happen, which was fortunate for the blind woman who someone led through the prayer line that night in Lakeport. She was an American Indian. Her irises simply weren't there. Bill talked with her a minute until he contacted her spirit. Then by vision he said, Nine years ago, a blood clot in your brain temporarily paralyzed you. Mostly you recovered, but that stroke pulled your eyes up into your skull and you've been blind ever since, suffering constantly day and night with no peace at all. Bill felt an extra burden of compassion for this woman because she reminded him of his mother, who was half Cherokee Indian. When he prayed for her in Jesus' name, the one who supplied the vision now reached out and touched this woman. Her eyes rolled back into the correct position, and she could again see the world such as it was, blurred with tears of joy. Refusing help from the person who led her there, she walked away from the podium on her own. That miracle ignited the faith of an elderly Lutheran gentleman sitting on the platform behind Bill, This man's wife suffered from a bleeding ulcer that had steadily grown worse in the last four years. Now his wife could not eat solid food. She had become so anemic that her doctor wanted to give her a blood transfusion and operate on her in a week. The old Lutheran gentleman prayed silently, Lord, if you will let Brother Branham heal my wife's problem, and if you will heal her tonight, I'll take the $500 I set aside for her operation and I'll give it to that Lutheran church they're building in Yukia. Instantly, Bill swirled around, pointing at the Lutheran man and said, You, sir, you just prayed that if God would heal your wife, you would donate the $500 for her operation to help build a Lutheran church. The old man felt faint. He managed to say, Friends, that is the truth. God doesn't want your money, Bill said, but he does want your faith. Sir, your wife is healed. That is, thus saith the Lord. The next morning, this man and his 80-year-old wife attended a Christian businessman's breakfast. Bill watched her eat ham and eggs with the zest of a woman half her age. As soon as William Branham got home from California, Mrs. Bosworth called from Florida to say that her husband was dying. Bill told her he would come right down. While Mita repacked their suitcases, Bill got the car ready and soon they were racing south and east to Florida. When they entered the hospital room, Fred Bosworth raised his bald head off the pillow and held out his bony arms. Bill hugged his old friend and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, quoting Elisha's last words to Elijah. Fred Bosworth said weakly, Son, always remember your mission. You are preaching the real gospel. Flopping back into a chair, Bill held his friend's hand. I'm 48 years old and I'm so tired. Maybe my ministry is about over. Nonsense. You're young. Your ministry hasn't even begun to be what it will be in the future. Stay on the field. Don't let these Pentecostal preachers muddy the water with their fanaticism. Go on with the gospel that you've got. I believe you are an apostle and a prophet of the Lord our God. Brother Bosworth, you were preaching the gospel before I was born. Out of all those years, what was the greatest moment of your life? Fred Bosworth didn't hesitate. The greatest moment of my life is right now. Soon the one whom I have preached about all these years, the one whom I love, he will come through that door and I'll go out with him. Bill felt like he was looking at the equal of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Brother Bosworth, we both believe the same thing. By the grace of God, I will preach the gospel until the last breath leaves my body. I will not compromise with the word. I will stay as true as I can to Jesus Christ. Someday I will meet you in a better land where we'll both be young forever. Bosworth smiled weakly. You'll be there, Brother Branham. Don't worry. A month later, Fred Bosworth lapsed into a coma for two days. Then suddenly he opened his eyes and sat up in bed. Extending his right arm, he shook the air like he was shaking someone's hand. Brother Jim, I haven't seen you since you died. You were one of my converts to the Lord at my meeting in Joliet, Illinois. Sister Julie, I led you to the Lord at my Winnipeg meeting. For two hours he greeted people in the room who had come to the Lord through his ministry but had died before him. 
Finally, he laid his head back on his pillow and fell asleep in the arms of Jesus. Fred Bosworth was 84 years old, on his way to eternity.